Okay, thank you. So uh, here come to uh, another section that uh, we will have uh, Jonathan. Uh, he is from uh, Center Charter Bank, a director of uh, Open API, Open Banking and API. So hello, John, Jonathan. Nice to meet you. Good morning. Yep. Good morning, Patrick. And uh, good morning, everyone. So um, thank you very much yep. for having me. Yeah. Really yeah, yeah. He will be glad to be that. part of this um, event. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he will be sharing about the open banking development and Santa Charter is really uh, 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 doing a lot of work here. So uh, I will, uh, I, I can see your screen here, so it should be fine. And uh, let me pass the time to you, Jonathan. So thank you. Thank you, Patrick. So um, to start with, actually, um, because today we have got only about 20 minutes, um, you know, uh, open banking, you know, uh, all started in, you know, Europe, the PSD two, two years ago. And you know, three years from now, we have got a lot of uh, new development from different parts of the world, and with some regulatory uh, driven and some market driven approach. So, um, because we don't have so much time to cover all these perspective, um, so today, um, my sharing would be more focusing on um, talking about use cases that are already launched in the market. You know, so that um, the audience can you know grab can grab better sense about you know. Um, the momentum, you know, where we are heading, key challenges and opportunities, etc. So, um, here's the agenda of the day. Um, I will try to cover three things um, in today's 20 minutes. The part one is the so-called global landscape, you know, how, how different parts of the world are doing in terms of open banking so far. And today, um, the use cases would be having um, more Asian elements. So, I will talk about, um, in particular, the use cases in Singapore, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, um, so that you know um, you can you can you can get the difference and similarities between these markets. And finally, um, maybe to get a better idea about you know what's next, what challenges and opportunities are facing ahead of us, uh, no matter from a banking perspective or from a you know fintech or ecosystem perspective. So um, to start with, I think. Um, um, the definition, I think um, the audience um, are pretty clear about, you know, open banking, open API. Basically, um, open banking allows trusted third parties or fintech companies to assess customer data, financial data held by the banks, you know, through some secure and standardized way of, you know, interacting. Namely, we call it the API. So um, this is like a quick recap on the global landscape. Today, I'm not going to spend all the time on the details because th this can take, you know, more than 100 minutes to, to cover um, each market one by one. But in general, um, the open banking all started in the, the, the European counterparts, you know, the PSD two, you know, three years ago, you know, as a you know, legislative um, approach that, you know, banks are mandatory and required to share customer data, you know, to, to partners or to companies who fulfill those, you know, onboarding requirements. So on, on the left hand side, you, you see that I, I put a um, line in the middle so um, you, you, you may discover that um, on the left-hand side, the use cases, you know, the approaches are more le legislative mandatory approach that, you know, you know, banks have to do it, you know, otherwise they will be, you know, uh, having trouble with their banking license. Whereas in the, um, the Asian approach or the Asian counterparts you can see in Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, is more organic. Um, so the beginning of the end, um, on the left-hand side, on the European or the Australian counterparts, once a company or, you know, a fintech partners or the TSP, TPP, um, depends on the terminology, once a fulfilling onboarding requirements from the government, then the banks have to share the customer data to them. So that is the mandatory basis. Whereas on the, on the right-hand side, um, it's actually up to the bank to decide whether they want to partner with that, you know, uh, platform or that, you know, TSP or TPP. So it is a, very much case by cases approach. So on 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 the left hand side, um, so far we have seen some key use cases mainly on account aggregation, personal finance management, uh, instant credit or pre approval and, and KYC. So how about Asia? Um, I think um, I take a look at the use cases, launch use cases in Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong. So far, I think. There are some similarities and there are some different use cases that I think um, I would like to use the remaining 10 minutes to zoom in. And I hope that you can find some inspiration, you know, uh, regarding, you know, how, you know, if you are a bank or if you are a TSP, you know, how you should position your company with regard to this kind of, you know, open banking development.
So in Singapore, I, I, I guess you heard about um, this um, platform called the SG Findex um, launched earlier this year. It's actually um, it's a government driven um, platform that uh, it works as a EID um, framework that allows all the citizens in Singapore to, you know, to retrieve that not just banking data, but also some government data. For example, the latest your retirement saving account balances, your tax bills, your outstanding, um, you know, HDB loans, plus the uh, bank account, saving account, you know, credit card uh, balance, etc. from seven banks. So basically, this is like um, this SG Findex is like a government driven um, account aggregation service that allows, um, you know, I think at this phase it's a view only, it's read only, but uh, allowing Singaporean citizens, you know, to get a single view about, you know, the, the, the financial situation, not just the bank, not just the bank balance, but, you know, including things like retirement saving and tax et cetera. So that is the things that um, um, uh, we, we see that seven banks, retail banks in Singapore has been plugged in to this platform and, and have gone live already. So that is um, pretty much interesting because um, you can see that despite the fact that um, the Singaporean government or the MAS do not require banks to, you know, mandatory to join this framework but because you can see this kind of use cases is is, is benefiting all the singapore citizens so actually all the major retail banks in singapore have joined this this platform so um that is i think one of the um latest use case um I, we believe that we'll be seeing we'll be gaining a lot of tractions in singapore so uh, by the way you can you can see the link um here that uh, actually we our bank also have uh, has a quick video about you know how you can uh, get connected you know as a consumer that you can connect it to this um SG FinTech. So if you are interested to know more about that, um uh, you are most welcome to you know to explore that um, with, with that link. So that is the situation in Singapore. So how about Taiwan? Actually, um, um Taiwan has got a pretty interesting use case as well. Um the uh, the exchange and clearing houses of Taiwan actually they launched a similar platform we call the TDCC e passbook actually um, earlier in quarter one this year six banks in Taiwan already gone live um, actually what is so special about this TDCC passport actually the concept and the use cases is pretty similar to the Singaporean counterparts in which um, if you are you know if you are customers of of these banks you are able to uh, allow to have a you know security account aggregation across the banks and then to see your deposit account aggregation as a new feature so that you can you don't need to switch around apps and then you can of course i think this year is only a read only but i think in the future it also allows you to you know switch over the account like the you know um the european counterpart so this this app is gaining traction as well um so far there are 2.5 million accounts open already and this app already got over 2 billion downloads already so um we believe that um this is something interesting um for the future in taiwan as well so back to hong kong um uh, in hong kong i'm sure that many of you understand about the four phases approach by hkma so phase one phase two being, you know, sharing public information like uh, product features, product locations, you know, branch features, et cetera. Et cetera. And a phase two being the, um, you know, the partner sending customer information to the bank as a way to, you know, facilitate, um, you know, retail product application. And then um, one thing to note is that um, three months ago, the HKMA published the uh, um, the formal report on the next phases on the open banking API journey. So you can see the link below that. Um, I encourage you to download it because actually it, it dictates a blueprint on, you know, what's next for, uh, you know, upcoming two phases. So for your information, for those who don't familiar, phase three um, of the open API in Hong Kong, it means it allows banks to sharing, to share customer data to um to the uh partners 
upon getting customer consent. And then phase four, um, it means it allows performing transaction uh, on 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 the on the partner side. And one thing to note is that um, HKMA has already officially classified the FPS up to a payment as part of the phase four um, open API phase four phase four scope as well. So you 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 would imagine that um, for merchants who have that kind of app to app payment capabilities would be fitting into this you know open API phase four context. So um, I know that time is is running out. We have got about maybe ten minutes left. So um, I accelerate. So um, I did uh, some stock ticking um, um, about you know what actually. Because Hong Kong launched the Open API Phase One and Two in 2019 and 2020, I'm curious, you know, how the TSP ecosystem looked like by far, you know, by combining, you know, all some major use cases in the Hong Kong banking industry enabled by Open API. And I realized there's three types of use cases so far launched in Hong Kong. Um, I will, I can see these could be categorized into three categories. Number one is being the real-time lead capture. So what does that mean? Is that you can see those partner on the you know top left-hand corner. Most of these are the mortgage brokers. So um, in the past, when you know when when these mortgage brokers they have to send in applications to the bank, mostly they have to do it in the paper form, or you know by email or by fax. You know, um, you know non-standardized approach and usually there's a time lag because um you know if uh, if an agent um they got customers who want to buy a house maybe tomorrow or one day later the the mortgage broker will, will send that customer information to the bank and ask the bank okay you contact that mr customer for for further information however with this open api it allows us these mortgage brokers to real time to send these customer list information to the bank so that the bank, upon receiving it um, instantly, they can call the customer right away to follow up. So um, you can see that, interestingly, this kind of mortgage brokers is getting a lot of traction uh, with this kind of open banking approach. And then the second type of use cases um, would be more on the instant approval or the application for banking products, for example, credit cards or some simple instruments or um, you know um, uh, banking accounts. With no stranger, I'm sure that um, you, you know that um, Standard Charter is a strategic partner of Cafe Pacific and Asian Mile. So actually, we, we branded our credit card and, and launched last month. So actually, some of uh, some some part of the process is also enabled by Open API so that we facilitate the you know the instant approval. And I'm sure that um, for you can see the HKTV more. You can see um, which is another strategic partners of another major retail banks in Hong Kong. So um, we can see that there are a lot of use cases um, relating to, you know, instant approval for credit cards or banking accounts, leveraging these, you know, strong clientele or membership data of these partners and facilitate this kind of application process. And the last type of use cases, um, I'm sure no, no stranger as well, is the shop and pay with points. So that is uh, this goes along with the you know use, usually the credit card usage program as well. So um, this is basically the um, you know as a nutshell the TSP ecosystem so far enabled by the Open API framework in Hong Kong. For details on the on the lower left hand corner you can see um, the HK uh, the Hong Kong Science Park Data Studio already contains all these um, launched use cases because. Um, thanks to HKMA, they require for all the banks in Hong Kong, if you launch new use cases, you have to publish that um, uh, use cases, the details, you know, uh, the company name, you know, the website, et cetera, into that data studio so that, you know, as a general consumers, you can check there, you know, whether this company has partnered with a bank or not, you know, you know, because there are some kind of fraudulent website there. So um, I think that kind of, um, approach by HKMA can protect the customer, you know, by, you know, um, you know, accidentally entering the information by, you know, uh, fraudulent reference. So for details, you can take a look at that data studio and for 
for all the use cases. So that is basically the situation in Hong Kong on the ecosystem. And you, you may have got a sense that, um, it seems that when comparing to the use cases in Taiwan or Singapore, you know, it's quite different, right? Because um, a lot of these use cases are not driven by the government, but, you know, rather it is like a bilateral agreement, case by case, commercial decisions with, you know, a specific partners that, you know, have, you know, have a lot of membership in Hong Kong. So that is the situation in Hong Kong. And because we don't have so much time to go through the detail, so um, I will skip this detail workflow, you know, you know how it happened. So um, if you have questions, we can cover that in the Q&A. Yeah, so um, I think by now you have got, you know, some high level senses about, you know, the Singapore, Taiwan, and Hong Kong use cases. For Singapore and Taiwan, they're more like the government have, uh, you know, uh, government owned platform aggregate all their accounts together. However, in Hong Kong, we still don't see that. And so that the HK, uh, the open API framework is also um, focusing on getting banks to talk to individual partners to come up, you know, a commercially viable use cases. So finally, it goes to the last part of today's presentation is that, okay, so you can see the difference uh, on the European counterparts, you have, you can see the mandatory approach, um, uh, mandatory approach, and then whereas in Singapore, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, you have got the you know um, market-driven approach. So, what are the challenges and opportunities ahead of us in terms of open banking? I would, I would put these into you know two sides. Number one is that in terms of opportunities, um, I think that um, no matter it is a mandatory approach or um, or uh, market-driven approach, we see the rise of embedded finance. Like, for example, you have new digital banks, partnership with non bank verticals. So that you, you will see more and more apps or uh, a fintech company, they add financial services or banking, you know, as an element in, in the overall client journey or overall uh, client offering. So that kind of um, momentum is building. So um, I would like to pose one question. Um, if if any companies, uh, fintech company who would like to, you know, have, would like to embed you know, banking in banking element into your journey is that does adding banking make sense with the user experience and how does that, you know, enrich your offering? So I think that is the one point that um, you may, you may consider. And the second opportunity we realize is that um, there's a rise of a call a things called a banking as a service, a white label banking solution. For instance, um, Standard Charter, we in in Indonesia, we actually partner with two uh, large e-commerce platform that um, you know we enable them to you know allow uh, financial services capabilities. For example, opening saving accounts or you know doing some simple loans. So that um, we see that this kind of model is also going to become. Uh, getting traction um, for you know as a white label uh, solution. So overall, we see that the opportunities enabled by open banking will be uh, allowing more non-bank partners, no matter your telco, your retail, or e-commerce, um, you know, to to get an opportunity to step into the financial services sector, and also for the banks. It also works for the banks to partner with these, you know, non-bank verticals to have a fast start in, you know, customer acquisitions, etc. However, we we also see that, um, you know, there are also challenges. So, as an industry, as banking practitioner, uh, looking from an inside perspective, um, I see that um, so far we see five challenges, especially, you know, when these kind of open banking. Is not mandatory driven, it's a micro driven. The first thing is about the cost and benefits discussion because um, whenever um, internally we need to launch or we want to build new capabilities to launch use cases, the first question we got inquired is about okay, from the management, it's about what is your business case? What is your you know benefit case? How do we see you know these kind of revenue projections? So, in that sense, um, we believe that if it is not um, 
having a, a revenue potential for the bank, it will be hard, you know, in a non-monetary uh, environment to, to, to do some use cases, you know, that are, uh, you know, that might be prominent in the, in the open banking space. And the second perspective is about whether you want to take a first mover or second mover advantage. Because we see that for, for example, larger banks or traditional banks, because I'm sure that uh, they will think about, okay, do I want to take a defend or tech approach, you know, when you see these, you know, new banks or virtual banks are coming. So um, whether, you know, if they take the first mover, will they be more prone to, you know, being being attacked to, you know, from, from the new banks or from other partners to, to acquire customers or they would like to take a, you know, wait and see approach. So they, they don't want to be a first mover, but they prefer to be a second mover to defend the core. So that is also um, a key question that is being constantly, you know, uh, debate be, being debated internally. And the third and the fourth point is about, is about the technical stack readiness. Because I'm sure that, um, you know, when, you know, API itself is a simple thing, but, you know, it requires a bank and a pass to invest continuously on, on, you know, on that kind of digital capability in order to, for that kind of, you know, partnership model to continue to scale and gain momentum. So the tech stack readiness um, would link to the, you know, inevitably the, you know, the so-called investment benefit, you know, what is the B case, what is in for me to continue, you know, spend 1 million, 2 million bucks of dollars, you know, into this kind of, you know, open a banking or open API capability. And the fourth, fourth point is that in Hong Kong, we, we, we noticed that um, if we need to launch a partner use cases, actually there are a lot of logistics and administrative work in onboarding, you know, for banking practitioner, I'm sure you are no strangers to hear things like TMU and outsourcing, you know, common baseline, that kind of stuff. Actually, it can talk, you know, weeks or some sometimes months for, you know, to get through all this, you know, internal second line approval, you know, and all the paperwork back and forth. So, you know, when we, so that's that's why when we launch a partners, when a launch a use case with us, we also factor in the lead time and the logistics involved, you know, in all these paperwork, you know, because HMA means serious business, you know, and, you know, we don't want to get them unhappy about, okay, we are not fitting this kind of common baseline or outsourcing or team even requirement, so, you know, so however time is money. So actually we also have to, have to factor in, you know, whether, you know, it worth the while to spend the time to, you know, onboard a partner. And finally, from a customer's perspective, because, um, at the end of the day, you know, we believe that this kind of open banking thing is to, you know, facilitate, you know, a better, superior customer experience. However, that is at the expense of, you know, they have to share data to, to the partners as well. So um, how ready or what is the uplift for a customer if they need to enjoy that kind of, you know, and better banking, open bank experience? at the expense of sharing that data, I think that is, um, you know, it takes time to build that culture in Hong Kong as well. So I think basically these summarize the challenges and opportunities um, we have seen so far in open banking. And uh, okay, I see that um, the HKMA report also identified the top three key challenges. Number one is the fraud and cyber security risk. Another one is about the tangible business benefits. And finally, it's about, you know, the technical development. I think um, I don't want to do deep dive into these reports because uh, you, you 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 can see it on, on the link previously. But uh, I think these are the food for thoughts um, that you may consider, no matter your bank or your a, your fintech company. Uh, you know whether you want to or how you want to um, shape your advantages in this kind of open banking development. Yeah. So finally. Um, if you want to get to know more about the standard charter API capabilities globally, please visit access.se.com, register a free account, and I'm sure that you'll be amazed by the you know large amount of API endpoints that we are available. So um, that's enough for today's presentation, and uh, thank you. So um, let's move to the yeah Q and A part. Yeah. Let me pop the screen. Okay, 
Hello, uh, Jonathan. So um, you share quite a lot. So um, maybe I will refer, I will still have the three minutes left. So I will try to uh, drill down to one question that I believe um, our Hong Kong audience will want to know more. You mentioned about the use cases in uh, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. And then from your experience, and then what uh, you, you said, you talk about the similarity, but what is the differences? Okay, talk about Hong Kong, how you can see maybe the Taiwan use cases, Singapore use cases, maybe different from Hong Kong, and etc. Can you sh have some tips for some uh, company or, or, or parlors from Hong Kong? Okay, so um, for instance, in Singapore and Taiwan, because the government already take the first step to you know to become a TSP, so mm. they, they they themselves become a you know a, a kind aggregator, so that they they already ah. fast started because you know consumers or customers they won't question okay whether I want to trust government because well. The government has your data anyway. <laughs> yeah, got it, got it. So, so the Singaporean and the Taiwan use cases is that, you know, it, it already covers this kind of customer, you know, mm. queries or, you know, why I need to share data. Mm. So that mm. comparing to Hong Kong, because in Hong Kong, so far, you know, when we talk about open API phase three, we know mm. that some companies, they want to do account aggregation. However, yep. no matter from banks or customer, because these companies, they're private companies, they're not government, they're not mm. government owned yep. platform. Then no matter bank or customer, they will ask, okay, why why do I need to share data to, to a private company, A mm -hmm. or not B and C? So I think that's mm -hmm. a major difference. And I think mm -hmm. that will pose a challenge. You know, if we want to, you know, um have the kind of account aggregation service being mm -hmm. being implemented in Hong Kong um smoothly. Okay, okay. So in, in the other words, uh, 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 we, we can see, so the, the barrier talking about in Hong Kong due to the, the worry of the uh, data sharing or liability or, or even talk about the trust because um, the, the open uh, banking user, they need to trust somebody. And, and then because uh, there's no solid uh, 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 bodies that can provide that level of trust yet, um, because uh, I would say a uh, bank want to open up something. So uh, talking about that parlor have the 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 the, the wood of trust. Then uh, it it seems that uh, it's a bit um relatively uh uh fall behind here. So okay, I, I think I got I got your point. So in the other words, uh, talking about um the open banking partnership in Hong Kong, uh, the bank will be looking for a more aggressive or even uh the the outcome will be having much more business value, so that you can uh, reach out that kind of uh, partnership thing. So um, yeah. is my understanding correct? Okay, okay, correct, got yeah. it, got it. Yeah. Because in general, because in Hong Kong, we don't have that kind of government driven platform. So it ups mm. to the bank to pursue, you know, one, yeah. one, one individual partnership with private companies. So that is, yep. you know, I would say the, the uniqueness of, of the yep. open banking landscape in Hong Kong. Yeah. Yeah, that's not about the trade off, the internal investment, yes. over etc. Okay, so uh, yeah, I think that's almost time. And then, Jonathan, you share a lot of um, uh, your insight talking about the Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore. And then I think it's also uh, inspiring to the audience here, especially some local uh, firm or stuff. So, friends, again, for Jonathan, so if you have uh, any questions, feel free to wish Jonathan offline. Okay, so uh, let's fill up the time uh, of Jonathan first. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Thank, thank you. Bye bye.